My name is Michael Johnson, and uh, and I'm here um, not necessarily to talk about the the stuff that I'm researching right now, but uh, we can also discuss that later. But uh, I want to talk about um, and how's the sound, by the way? Is this okay? Great, great. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a little philosophy today, uh, and uh, I want to make the the big claim we can say that uh, that when you're making neurotech, you're actually doing philosophy about what kind of thing we are, um, and uh, and likewise when you're doing philosophy about uh, or neuroscience about what kind of thing we are, what kind of thing a nervous system is, um, you're also doing uh, yeah the the other. So anyway. Um, a little bit of, a, of intro, um, I wrote a book on technical consciousness research, uh, Principia Qualia, and I, I co-founded a research institute and, uh, and left two years ago. I'm in the process of founding another, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of known, uh, who here has read, read uh, some of my stuff? Okay, great, uh, nice. Um, Cool. Uh, so let's let's talk about the details. Um, I think a, one thing that really gets easily lost in the noise uh, of sort of talking about neuroscience, talking about neurotechnology, is these fields are truly pre-paradigmatic. Um, it's you know, we can call it neuroscience, we can call it neuroengineering, et cetera, uh, but that doesn't make it uh, sort of properly uh, paradigmatic. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not that we don't have stories about how the brain works. It's that we have so many stories, uh, and, uh, and none are uh, as predictive as we would like. Um, uh, so that's that's not to say that there's a lot, not a lot of high quality uh, work going on. Uh, it's just that there's also, uh, frankly, a lot of bullshit, and the only antidote uh, antidote to bullshit is good taste. Um, so uh, my my second big claim here is that neuroscience needs treasure maps. Uh, that's um, uh, we're certainly building technological capacity uh, much faster than we're figuring out how to improve people's lives with it. Uh, you know, we, we can have uh, very, very advanced, you know, we can put wires in the brain, and then what do we do with those wires? And the, the techniques that we found are pretty simple. Let's just pass electricity in the wires. Uh, let's use, you know, let's try 20 hertz. That didn't work. How about thirty? And so it's it's uh, it's a, like our our techniques tend to be fairly simple. Um, and uh, there's this this term called a hardware overhang, uh, and it's often uh, used in sort of the AI safety space. Uh, they talk about a hardware overhang for AI or AGI. That if we only had the right software, well. Our computers are already good enough to, to run it. Um, and I think that today in neurotech, we have a hardware overhang. Uh, our tech is usually pretty pretty great. Uh, I mean, if you're following the, the, the Neuralink uh, numbers, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, but we don't necessarily know what to do with this tech. So um, one one common theme, I think, in, uh, that we'll see more and more as, as time goes on is that um, treasure maps are extremely useful because like, having a, a goal state, having sort of, okay, like uh, knowing what a good direction even is in the brain or like what a good state is, uh, I think that's just incredibly useful. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, things like Buddhism, uh, yoga, et cetera, have, have these wonderful treasure maps. And this is one thing that I, I really appreciate about the using the jhanas as a treasure map. 
I think it's a fantastic approach. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, if um, if we've spent uh, many person centuries on building building good maps of interesting states and uh, and wholesome states, uh, that's that's worth a lot. Uh, my third uh, claim um, is that every neurotechnology project is an implicit thesis on what kind of a what kind of thing a nervous system is and what kind of thing a human is. And uh, in, in kind of a, a compressed quip, I would say neurotech is perhaps the platonic form of applied philosophy. Uh, and that uh, this also gives us uh, some tools to critique neurotech projects. That um, if a neurotech project doesn't have a clear implicit thesis about what kind of thing nervous systems are, then it's at least partially a LARP. It's at least partially this sort of, well, maybe if we just stick some advanced technology in the brain, magical things will happen. Um, and I'm not so optimistic about that. Uh, so, mm, I, I, I guess, uh, just frankly speaking, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of good things we can say about humans. I think we're awesome. I think we're beautiful. And more human, not less, I think is a, is a very good sort of theme for neurotech. But uh, this is somewhat, or somehow underdetermined. We, you know, it can kind of point in, in many directions. So more on that in a bit. Uh, so there's a, uh, I believe it comes from Warhammer 40K, uh, this idea that if something doesn't die, uh, shoot more bullets at it. Um, <laughs> And uh, in medicine, this is called the Mordaka theme. And um, Sir Constantine had a, had a great uh, framing on this, that the Mordaka story is common in medicine. You do an intervention, things don't get better, or only gets a little bit better, and the research says, okay, well, this didn't work. But uh, often it's just, well, we didn't do enough of it. Uh, we didn't do it at a uh, sufficient intensity, or uh, we didn't layer uh, different things on. Uh, and uh, like antibiotics nowadays, um, single antibiotics often don't work, but triple antibiotics do. Uh, cancer, you have, you know, I don't know how many different cancer drugs at the same time that you just uh, you layer on, and and it usually uh, it works that way. Same with HIV B drugs and. Um, with a seasonal affective disorder. Uh, does anyone have seasonal, seasonal defective disorder? Yep. Uh, so the, the finding there is that um, the lights that, uh, that are sold for uh, seasonal affective disorder just aren't bright enough. And if you just have you know, four of them or six of them or whatever, if you get more light, it actually works. Um, so I do think, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Do I? Oh, oh. Um. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, happy to, yeah, uh, happy to chat. That's, thank you. Uh, so, um, one of the, one of the um, comments that I would uh, I would offer is that um, neurotech is generally thought of as uh, you know you put like wires in the brain and then you like do stuff or you put like at least you have to measure things with EEG and and so on um, but um, like I get the sense that uh, successful neurotech uh, and I'm I'm not quite sure that we've seen successful neurotech yet. Um, but it might be pretty strange, and it might not be what we think of as neurotech. Uh, and it could be very simple. Um, I really liked this. Uh, I don't know if you, if you guys can see it. I'll. Oops. No, that didn't work. 
Okay, um, so Milan uh, Sitovic uh, had the tweet, the most potent legal neurotechnologies, dogs, music, caffeine. Uh, and I think that's beautiful. Uh, I think that we should keep an open mind about what exactly neurotech is. Um, so uh, I say six, but it might be five. We'll see what we have time for. Uh, but um, I guess this, in a way, this is um, ideas that I hope people steal. Uh, in a way, uh, this is sort of requests for startups. Uh, so uh, we can just kind of kind of talk through these things. Um, so the the first oh and um, I'll go back here. Um, so this is, uh, as, as part of this framework, um, there's the insight or the model, uh, which is more philosophical. And then there's the intervention, which is the actual technology. And it's sort of, I try to present the, the insight or the model and then say, okay, how could we operationalize this? How could we turn this into some sort of real tech? Um, so the first, uh, I'm gonna call it an insight. Uh, is that uh, there's this thing called fractal dimensionality. And it's basically the, uh, the branching factor of a pattern. And um, like trees uh, have a branching factor, like a, a fractal dimensionality uh, between 1.4 and 1.6, generally speaking. And, uh, and like if it's two, then it's a, it's a complete um, plane. And if it's one, it's just a line. So like 1.4, 1.6, it's like a tree branch, basically. And um, empirically, we humans really like things in the range of 1.4 to 1.6, exactly what you find in trees. And uh, also empirically, our nervous systems seem to be uh, to have this fractal dimensionality as well. It's, it's called the, the Hausdorff dimension. Um, and uh, one interesting thing here too is that uh, um, in, in studies of the environment, uh, the finding is that um, being around trees has a very powerful antidepressant effect. Uh, it's just you, you feel better if you can see trees, uh, whereas Interestingly, uh, very interesting, I think, uh, grass doesn't. If you're on grass, uh, if you, you, know, you have a nice you know, view of, of a grassy field from your, your office, uh, it doesn't help nearly as much as if you can see trees. So I think that's important, actually. And, um, and you can do a similar analysis for, uh, for sounds as well, sort of. Um, so, Interestingly, uh, Jackson Pollock paintings. Uh, is everyone familiar with Jackson Pollock? Uh, he just kind of, um, you know, uh, the, the story is that he just kind of randomly uh, slops paint on some canvas and people buy it for a lot of money. But I think this is wrong uh, because when you analyze the fractal dimensionality, like the, the branching factor of the lines in Jackson Pollock paintings, it happens to be between 1.4 and 1.6. Uh, and I think this is, this is profoundly important. Um, so uh, now we get to the, uh, uh, the part of the, uh, the thesis here. Uh, does everyone know what the Tetris effect is? Uh, okay, so it's, uh, it's when you're playing Tetris and uh, you're, you're making these lines and you know you're you're getting the four uh, four dealer in the hole, and uh, like that's that's kind of the purpose of your life for the the duration of the game. Um, then like you'll close the game, you'll go do something else, maybe you'll go rest or, or try and sleep, and like when you close your eyes, you just see Tetris pieces, uh, and it's it's like a, a very notable thing, Tetris is just very effective at eliciting this, this pattern. Um, and uh, I would say that this is, this is a, a very important thing in that um, modern life in general 
um, it isn't fractal. It doesn't have this fractal dimensionality of, of 1.4 to 1.6. And you know, maybe, uh, maybe this specific room is doing pretty well uh, <laughs> with all these beautiful paintings. Um, but uh, there are also a lot of sort of hard edges here. And um, our nervous systems really adapt to our environment. And um, I frame it like we, we pinch our sort of scale-free networks into scale-specific circuits to accurately predict things. And, uh, and just modern life is just filled with sort of weirdly discrete dimensionalities. Uh, and I would call modern life just one big Tetris effect. And, uh, and then so the, the, one of the conclusions here is that one time, or one reason we need time in nature is to reset this, to get back to sort of, uh, to, to pull our networks apart back into their, their normal shapes. So uh, first idea someone uh, should definitely steal. Um, I'm calling it uh, so an Apple Vision Pro app for tracking nature seconds per hour. Uh, so imagine the Apple Vision, okay, you're wearing an Apple Vision Pro and it can see everything you can see. It can hear everything you can hear. And then basically it adds up how much fractal dimensionality between this uh, 1.4 to 1.6 range there is. Uh, and then it gives you a rolling score. Uh, how natural is your environment? How stressful is your environment? And uh, maybe an office cubicle gives, you know, 400 nature seconds per hour. Uh, maybe a walk in the woods gives, you know, almost a perfect score. And maybe a tasteful home office or, or like this, this environment gives maybe, you know, 1,200 nature seconds per hour. So um, in terms of, you know, it's, it's not everything about what, a, what makes a, a natural, uh, like easeful environment versus a stressful environment, but I would love to have uh, this app. So please, please, someone make it. Happy to, happy to chat about it. Uh, so this is a hypothetical app. It doesn't exist. Um, I, I hope someone makes it. Yes. Yeah, nice, nice. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there are also other uh, possible variants for, for this uh, long story. But um, so the, the second insight that I would, uh, I would offer um, is that some people feel nice to be around. And, uh, and there's this really important question, well, why? Uh, and <clears throat> I wrote an essay uh, recently on this. Um, it's called um, Presence Neurotechnology, sort of the, the minimum viable technology for recreating the, the felt sense presence of someone. Like, uh, <clears throat> could we make some technology that where um, uh, it felt like Shinzen Young was, was in the other room or your wife was in the other room or whatever, like you couldn't see her, but you, you felt her energy. Um, so uh, that gets into the, the sort of technical stuff, but just as a, as a, a minimum viable product, just kind of, not, not necessarily a product, but just kind of a, a test of this, uh, one thing that I hope someone makes, and again, this is just a, you know, a bunch of requests for startups here, uh, is an Apple Watch app that uh, you, you install it with someone else, you, you sync up with someone else, and then it just mirrors their heartbeat on your watch. And whatever rhythm you're in, they feel on, on their watch, and you feel their rhythm. And I don't know what this would feel like, I don't know what this would do, but uh, I think this is the sort of research that uh, it would be easy to do, and someone should definitely do it. So, I think all the all the foundation is there. I just need to do it. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's you know more sort of sophisticated, uh, complex approaches that you could take. Um, I kind of like the idea of uh, if you have a meditation teacher. Um, if you sort of put a lot of electrodes on them all over their body, and then you have students meditating, well, what if you put electrodes on them as well? And then whatever the electrodes from the teacher are measuring, 
you sort of gently uh, transmit to the students what would happen. Um, I'm not sure, but I hope someone does it. Uh, so the, the third uh, idea that I would share um, is, uh, have you guys, um, who here has read Neural Annealing? Okay, a decent, cool. Uh, so I wrote a, an essay back in 2019 uh, and entitled Neural Annealing. And the basic, uh, basic model is that um, you know, if you have some piece of broken metal, like a broken shovel or sword or something, um, then you take it to a blacksmith and you, you say, hey, can you, can you fix this for me? And what does the blacksmith do? Uh, the black blacksmith heats it up uh, until it melts, uh, and the, the more technical term for this would be entropic disintegration. You, you add energy until the existing attractor landscape uh, disintegrates. Um, and then uh, you hammer it into place, and then you let it cool. And depending on the rate at which it cools, you know, some blacksmiths might choose to, to quench it in water or quench it in oil or let it uh, air dry. Uh, you get different sort of um, microcrystalline patterns in, in the material. Um, but basically, the, you get a, a full reset in the microstructure. Uh, the, the sword is fixed, or the shovel is fixed, or, or whatever it was. Um, and, uh, and in a very simple sense, this is what I think is happening uh, during um, meditation, music, psychedelics. Uh, not only this, but, uh, but I do think that this is a very good compression of that. So I originally wrote uh, Neural Annealing as a two-part thing. Um, one was the description of the, the model, and the second part was a product. Like, okay, like let's turn this into a technology. Uh, and the idea that I had was um, music feels good. Uh, turning up the volume on music makes it feel even better. That's interesting. Uh, so, but there's, there's a limit to that. You can only get so loud until your ears are, are uh, not, not so happy with it. Uh, but if you expand it to more senses and you touch more of the brain's sensory surface area, then uh, that's like turning up the volume way over uh, the, the perceptual limit. Um, so uh, we looked at uh, light, sound, uh, light sound vibration, LSV devices, uh, synchronized to music, um, with the idea that, well, maybe you could uh, you'd get a, a psychedelic trip without psychedelics if you just sort of amplified the music in this way. You, kinda, you can dig into a lot of interesting experiences, like going to a rave. Well, why is that so intense? Well, it kind of drives your, your whole brain uh, as, you know, with this pattern. So um, I think that you can just kind of naively, you know, take a piece of existing music and multiplex it, um, or you can kind of uh, do some, some feedback or, or like choose, for example, some, uh, some sound with a lot of the, like mm, the same sort of dimensionality of motifs, we can say, uh, yeah, bioactive sound. Like a rave is an LSB situation. It's light, it's sound, it's vibration. I, I would say that uh, it's uh, a narrative situation and a very intense situation uh, exactly because it's sort of pushing the swing on its, its adding energy to the system. Uh, now, we can talk about brain versus body and, and embodiment. Uh, frankly, the more energy you have in your system, the more sort of sensitive to sensory stimuli you will be. So the more uh, things like that can get you even further. Okay, uh, model four, bioelectricity. Uh, so we have uh, uh, my friend there, uh, Ben, who uh, knows, uh, knows a lot about this. Um, and generally speaking, humans have a bioelectric field and it's very important, uh, significant for health. And um, it, kind of the, the more woo frame is we have an energy body. Well, yeah, we literally do. Uh, and I think that uh, like the, 
the picture that the research is, is showing is that um, this is significant at multiple levels of the organism. Uh, so you have uh, uh, cells sort of um, function by the electrical polarity between uh, what's outside the membrane and what's inside the membrane. And then uh, organs also often have electrical gradients. Um, and then your overall electrical field, um, it's looking like uh, is sort of a, a morphological field, uh, I believe the the term is, um, and basically, uh, like the the signal that tells your cells, okay, um, grow grow an arm, grow fingers, but stop there, uh, grow in exactly this shape. Uh, this is probably dominated by electromagnetic local electromagnetic uh, considerations. One one core question for me. Uh, and this is sort of um, a precursor to talking about, well, let's, how do we technologize this? But it's trying to reimagine a lot of the normal, we can say normal wear and tear or normal dysfunction as disorders of bioelectricity. Uh, and I think cancer is a perfect example that, yeah, actually it is a disorder of bioelectricity. Um, you know, we can we can talk about you know this mutation or, or that mutation, but actually, sort of the um, the most elegant compression is that well, something is wrong with morphogenic morphogenic field. And my expectation here is that a lot of things are like this. That if we if we have this very central coordination regime for the body uh, for cells for tissues and organs and for overall morphology, then, uh, I mean, it's got a lot of details and for sure things will go wrong a lot. And, you know, uh, hopefully uh, it's, it's got some error correction, but uh, I, I foresee a lot of the things that we think of uh, as very different, very disparate, not connected at all, will actually be connected. And, and then the question becomes, well, what kind of interventions are possible? Um, and uh, like one, one thought, and I'm you know, looking forward to, to digging, with in this, in, digging into this with Ben, but um, uh, just like, so one kind of interesting observation here is that when you take opioid painkillers, you scar more your body produces more scar tissue. And uh, as far as I know, I'm, I'm not sure how widely it was tested, but um, it was framed as opioids. Part of the mechanism of opioid painkillers is it allows uh, peripheral tissues or just kind of, um, it allows dropouts from the electromagnetic field. And so you don't get the pain and I, I suspect that a lot of other things would be kind of fitting this pattern too. Um, I'm thinking about like cellulite. And maybe that's also a dropout from the EM field and, uh, and so on. And so uh, just in terms of thinking, okay, what kinds of interventions could you use on like the body's morphogenic field that kind of enforces shape uh, and, uh, and structure? Um, I mean, if you break a bone, uh, you can rig up a splint and uh, and kind of regrow, you know, kind of keep things uh, correct as it regrows. Uh, could you also rig up an electromagnetic magnetic splint that sort of fixes your EM field in the proper shape as your tissues regrow? If I if I want to say one thing here, uh, it's that if we could actually visualize the EM field if we could see it with our eyes. We are very visual creatures, and uh, we're, our sort of intuitions get a lot better if we can see it uh, in real time, in high resolution. So basically, uh, whoever figures out how to rig up a system, maybe you know, with, with uh, the Oculus Quest or the, the Apple Vision Pro, where you could actually see the EM field, uh, that would absolutely change the world. Uh, it would fix so many things. So please, someone, someone do that.
Uh, so mm -hmm. just a, a few notes on the stuff that I'm working on right now. Um, so last year, I, uh, I released a paper uh, called Principles of Vasocomputation. And it's basically this, uh, this thesis that tension regulates neurons. Uh, and that um, tension in an area, uh, by, by cutting off blood flow, you force neurons, local neurons, into a, a safe mode where they don't update. So uh, you can sort of think about the brain as a, as a holistic programming environment uh, where you can sort of catch patterns by clenching. This is not necessarily um, a technological thesis. I think that the, the body just uses this principle. Um, there was a, a paper in 2007 called the hemoneural hypothesis. Uh, there were two very interesting observations made. And the first observation, uh, which was pretty extreme, uh, is that blood flow in normal brain tissue varies by a factor of 20. Not 10%, not 20%, but 20x. Uh, and then the second observation was that change in, changes in blood flow precede changes in neural activity. So there's been follow-up work uh, last year that, uh, that confirmed the, the sort of causal thing, that um, it's not that neural stuff happens and then blood comes to, to feed it, it's that the blood comes and then neural stuff changes. Like, I, I think that this is, a, this is a very interesting sort of lens or, or window to, to look at the brain in. And that um, mm, it sort of reimagines a lot of things uh, about um, brain stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, long story short, uh, I think that, uh, like, the, I mean, this is what I'm spending my, my hours thinking about right now. And uh, the tech implication that I just want to, you know, kind of share and, you know, it's, it's also a request for startups, is that technology, that technology that releases tension is incredibly valuable. And it'll have sort of a lot of implications. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, happy to, happy to chat about that um, later. So, okay, uh, this is just a, a research stub, but uh, happy to, to chat with people about it later. Um, so to, to wrap up, um, there are a lot of ways to frame what is a human, uh, how to become more human. Um, and I think that, uh, it would be very interesting for people, uh, to sort of see, uh, like to, to maybe consider doing this exercise, uh, maybe, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning, etc. Um, just if you picked your three time, uh, three all time favorite quotes about, about humans, about society, about the human condition, etc., cetera, uh, and just try to, to write out what might this imply about what kind of thing a human is and what might this imply about what sorts of technology could bring more of this into the world. So thank you.